Thank you for joining us for this edition of Prophecy in the News. I'm your host, Dr. Kevin Clarkson, and today our guest is Dan Goodwin, who is a preacher, uh, evangelist, prophecy teacher, author, researcher. It's good to have you, Dan. Boy, keep going. That, that sounded good. All but, right, uh, sir. I'm just, I'm just a nobody that uh, God is using and and uh, glad to be here, though. I love Prophecy News, love your audience, and uh, glad to be with you. Yeah, our people God. love you, and you've uh, had a special, unique emphasis on God's final jubilee and the barley harvest. And you're kind of following some new trends now with a, a, a new resource you've got called Prophecy Unsealed. And this is a uh, four presentation set with two D- DVDs, right? Right. Brand new, just out. You guys, uh, you guys got the first ones. All right, the and, world uh, premiere, huh? Yeah. So. Uh, uh, they're here, and your audience can call right here and get them. But uh, it's a DVD set, uh, a brand new DVD set that has my PowerPoint presentations in them. Now you're speaking as well. It's not I just speak PowerPoint. And I'm speaking. Uh, I think I think this one includes this four sessions. The first one's on the prophetic calendar, the seven feasts of the Lord. Yeah, we'll talk uh, about that in a minute. Yep. And the second one's on the on the barley harvest. Oh no, the jubilee. Uh huh. And then the barley harvest, and then when time shall be no more. And there's four of them on there, that, and they include a PowerPoint with it. Uh, very helpful to people, I think. Oh, well, very, very good. We, we want to talk, uh, of course, the PowerPoint, uh, as viewers may know, uh, is just graphic and uh, writing bullet points uh, to help kind of yeah. focus their attention. They not only hear you say it, but they see it. Uh, yeah. And I assume you're in the video as well, sp- right. the I, image uh, of you. but. The PowerPoint is in there. And I, you know, in case your viewers, uh, some of your viewers may be confused. Wh- what is PowerPoint? Uh, I'm a preacher. I've, I've been preaching a long time. I have, I don't know, I had a mental block about PowerPoint. I, I didn't want to use it. Uh, I thought it would hinder me because yeah. I'm a preacher. I like to move around. I like to hit the pulpit. And I right. like to go off on rabbit trails, you know, and we, <laughs> with my shotgun. But right. uh, um but I, uh, as I went to prophecy conferences and I watched other preachers using PowerPoint, I said, uh-huh. man, how helpful that is. Mm-hmm. Imagine, uh, brother, uh, you're preaching at your church and you want to talk about the, the statue in Daniel chapter 2. Remember the head of gold and the, you know, you got the statue that. Uh, right, right. Uh, it would take 15, 16 minutes to explain that to an audience without PowerPoint. Uh-huh. With PowerPoint. While you're talking about it, it's on the screen behind you. Yeah, a picture's worth a thousand uh, words. Yeah, and so. you can use your pointer if you want, and uh, um, you can explain Surely. that thing in a couple minutes. Yeah. You could explain, there's the head of gold, that's, that's Nebuchadnezzar, he's the head of gold, and you go all the way down to the ten toes. And so I decided to try PowerPoint, and yeah. uh, I'll tell you what it's done. It's helped keep me focused, uh, because you're using a PowerPoint presentation, you kind of got a, it's an outline almost, so... Um, now, what we did in the DVD is I'm speaking and the camera's on me and I'm explaining just like I always do about the seven feast and the, the Jubilee and all this. And then my wife takes that video. Thank God for my wife. Boy, what a help she's been. But uh, I take I go home with the video and my wife puts my PowerPoint presentation in there. So God I'm speaking and then all of a sudden a, a screen, uh, uh, the screen goes to uh, a slide that's in there. Um, and explains uh, in great detail what I'm talking about. So what a, what a help that is, and I think I think your viewers will be uh, very helped by being able to see what we're talking about on the screen. Well, uh, let's let's jump into the content. Uh, l- a lot of our viewers are somewhat familiar with the seven feasts of Israel, but you are bringing some uh, understanding to this about the timeline and prophetic calendar of God. Go ahead and uh, now the tell seven us what feasts. <laughs> I think here's what a lot of us miss. The seven feasts are all in Leviticus chapter 23. That's where I am. It's, it's got a, a Bible here and it's open there. It's a, and in fact, it says these are my feasts. God says these are my feasts. Now, we, we, try, to, we try to say we're going to have our, this is our feast. No, it's God's it's feast. It's God's feast, yes. And uh, there's seven of them. And here's what's interesting that I think a lot of us have missed. All seven of them are prophetic. Now, we talk about the last three. Feast of Trumpets and Day of Atonement and Tabernacles, end time events, the rapture, Yet the second future. coming and the millennium, the kingdom age. But you know what? All seven of them are prophetic. Yes. Now people people say, well, what do you mean by that, brother? Well, the other ones are all gone. Yeah, but they weren't fulfilled when they were written. That's right. <laughs> they were given to Moses in 1500 B.C. approximately. That's uh, that's a long time. They waited they and f- celebrated a, a millennium and a half to see yeah. what happened. Yeah. So they for fifteen hundred years, they kept those feasts and they they pointed to something in the future. All seven of them did. Well, let's just kind of review and remind ourselves how the first four. 
So the first one, Passover fulfilled. is the beginning of it all. The calendar begins with Passover during the barley harvest. Right. In fact, they brought they were they came out of Egypt in the month of Bib, which means the barley was ripe. There has to be barley if it's Passover month. And uh, so he, he brings them out. Passover happens on the full moon of that month of Bib, Nisan, we call it. Uh, Passover is on the full moon on the 14th of that month. And they they killed the lamb. They put the blood on the doorpost. And uh, that's Passover. Right. They did that for 1500 years until John the Baptist comes and says, behold, the lamb of God, which takes away the sin of the world. Here. Here's the Passover lamb. Jesus Christ, the Passover. Right, right. So he goes to the cross three and a half years later. He goes to the cross, pays the sin debt of the world, becomes God's Passover lamb. First Corinthians five, seven. Christ, our Passover is yeah. given for you. Yeah. Uh, from what I understand, they haven't killed lamb since. Uh, there's no reason to. Even the Jew subconsciously knew that the lamb had come. And, of course, of course, the uh, the diaspora happens and they're all scattered and all that temples gone. But uh, um, so that was fulfilled Indeed. by Jesus Christ right to the exact day. The mo by the way, at 3 p.m., 3 to 6, they tell me uh, I read just last night. They would kill their lamb sometime after at three o'clock in the afternoon, somewhere around there. Jesus died exactly three uh -huh. p.m. He goes to the cross at nine in the morning. At twelve noon, it grows pitch black, and I've got I've, I've got a whole lesson that I teach on that. I believe the sin debt of the world was paid during the three hours of darkness on the cross. I do too. I think God. You and I agree on a lot we're, of things. We're on the beam on some things. We, uh, We've never discussed that. I believe God turned the lights off because yeah. God didn't let anybody see it. I believe the countenance of Jesus was so contorted and horrifying. Oh, it's he was enduring hell. He, God was compressing all eternity into three hours. You're exactly where I'm at. And on putting the sins of every human who has ever lived or ever will live on one spot, on yeah. one man. You see, the wages of sin is not three hours in hell. No, it's, it's eternity. Yeah, that's right. Somehow in the mind of God, and we could never yeah. explain this, Somehow, in the mind of God, Christ paid the eternal sin debt of every human being. And I believe God kind of covered his son at that horrific moment. In Isaiah 53, it pleased the Lord to, to bruise, bruise him. him. Yes. I believe God the Father turned his back. Brother, we're and walking. Jesus cries out at 12. We're walking on holy ground right now. Eli, Eli, Sebastian, and I, my God, my God, why has thou forsaken me? God the Father turns his back on his son, turns the light off, even the people standing around the cross. It got pitch black. We believe the same eerie. thing. And like in a deep, dark cave, there. you can't see your hand in front yeah. of your eyes. At 3 p.m., he said, into thy hands I commend my spirit. And he gave up the ghost and died at 3 p.m. They come to break the legs, and he's already gone. And that made the earthquake that much more terrifying because they didn't yeah. know what was going to happen, and it was dark. They didn't know the, the light would come you back. You ever see the movie uh, Ben-Hur? Uh-huh. In the 50s. They they hit it right on. They yeah. had the the blood coming down in the rivers the, in the in the rain. Uh -huh, uh -huh. They had the thunder. Uh, for a Hollywood movie in the fifties, I'll tell you what they did a good job on that. They very did a remake movie. of that this year too, and it was done very well. Yeah. I don't know if you've seen the new one. That's right. So last summer it was very right. good. Very yeah. good. Well, it came so out Passover is fulfilled. <coughs> Fifteen hundred years after it was given, so it was prophetic. Now those are bundled together. The first right. three. In fact, in some places, it, the Passover is called a seven-day event. But basically, Passover is a four-day event. It begins on the 10th right. with the choosing of a lamb. That's when Jesus rides in on the donkey. That's the choosing of the lamb. Uh, he presents himself as their Messiah. And, they, and he goes in four days later. They kill the lamb, just like yeah. just right out of Exodus. And the lamb was inspected. And the, right. the Roman procurator stood and said, I find no fault in him. Right. Interesting, huh? Very. He and, wasn't the uh, high priest, but... Since the high priest had lied and listened to false witnesses, the Gentile bore witness that the, the lamb was without blemish. Now, did you, do you know the high priest at that moment that he rides in on the donkey, going to go through the eastern gate? At that same moment, the high priest is out at the courtyard inspecting the lambs and picking one to be the, the Passover lamb for Israel, not realizing coming in the eastern gate is the Amen. lamb. Amen, amen. Amazing. Of course, that God's, 12, God's uh, amazing choreography of events. So unleavened bread begins that night of yes. Passover. At 6 p.m. begins the Feast of Unleavened Bread. That's that's getting sin out. out. Uh, that's figurative of that. Removal. Christ is put in the tomb, I believe, exactly 6 p.m. Wednesday, which is Thursday. Uh -huh. 
because the day starts at 6 p.m. Not everybody agrees with me here, but yeah. uh, I don't believe in Good Friday. I believe Christ died on Wednesday. I believe three days and three nights he rises from the grave. 6 p.m. Saturday on the Feast of First Fruits. Now, 6 p.m. Saturday is now Sunday on the Jewish calendar. Right. So we get confused about this, but it doesn't matter. But uh, what matters is he rose from the grave three days later on the Feast of First Fruits. He f so he fulfilled those three in a three-day period. He dies on the cross in Passover exactly when you would kill the lamb on the full moon. He, uh, he's in the grave during the Feast of Unleavened Bread, proving there was no sin in his body, no leaven. <laughs> Rises from the grave on the Feast of First Fruits. The women show up the next morning. He's been gone for hours. And uh, uh, he, up from the grave he arose up with a mighty triumph over his foes. And then the last uh, of the spring feet, the last of the first four, is 49 days later is Pentecost. And we know that from Acts chapter 2. They're in the upper room there. Uh, Jesus, 10 days earlier, ascended back to heaven, wait for the promise of the Father, be endued with power. Indeed. And Pentecost is fulfilled uh, on that 50th day. And, uh, of course, they go out and they, they preach in the city. All those men are there because that's one of those three times that all the Jewish men had to be in Jerusalem. Right. Pentecost was one of them. So they had a captive audience. So they leave the upper room. All the men. That's why there were 3,000 men added. Those were men there. They had to be there. And they went out and preached to this captive audience. And 3,000 were added to the Lord. Those first four feasts were prophetic in, Mo in Moses' day. And were fulfilled in Jesus' day. And, and that's great. I mean, that gives us confidence, not yeah. only in God's power, but in his faithfulness and in his proscribing and predicting precisely and what he's going to do. If he fulfilled those first four right to the exact day of the feast, yeah. that's why I, I just can't get past this thing that the, the rapture the is going to be a fall event. Well, and it, it will be on the day of the feast right. if we follow I, this I line of thought. And we can't be dogmatic, but... Why would it not be? It seems very reasonable. Yeah. It seems like God to do that. I want to stop right here and we're talking to Dan Goodwin. Uh, we'll continue with the feast to come and much more. Talk about the barley harvest. We'll be doing two programs. Uh, we'll be talking about uh, just the, the, the final coming together of the final jubilee mm -hmm. and uh, what time it is and all of that. Mm -hmm. Wanted to offer this uh, resource to you. It's called Prophecy Unsealed. And there are four presentations on here by... Dan Goodwin, the seven feasts, the jubilee, the barley harvest, and when time shall be no more. And we uh, are offering this, and you can get the details and uh, the cost and shipping and handling by calling the 800 number on your screen or going to prophecyinthenews.com. This is brand new, fresh stuff. Uh, as he said, it's not only a uh, video of him speaking, but it's a uh, PowerPoint blended in, then you can see and access all the information directly that way i put the seven feasts right on the screen for them to see i put the dates i put uh, what ha you know yes boy what a help it is uh and what a help it is to me when i'm presenting this stuff to of have course. it on a screen there uh, i think it'd be a great resource for people um i, I i'm not in this for money i, I want to get the truth out there yeah well, let's leap into the three future feasts, and then we have other things we can talk about. Yeah, as well. so the three, the, the three that are left are still prophetic, just like all seven of them were. Now, they right. have figurative meanings right. as well, but they're, a, they're prophetic. And these last three all take place in the same month. They take, in, in the month, the Jews call the month Tishri, which is a fall month. It's usually September or October in our calendar. Yeah, our calendars don't period. sync, so right. it's different every year. Um, but they all take place in a 15 day period. Basically starts on day one, which is the new moon in the sky. That's Tishri one feast of trumpets. And that, hey, that's the day no man knows the day of the hour of because it, you have to see the, You have to sight the new moon in the sky. And so it could be at 3 p.m., which is one day or it could happen at 8 p.m., which is the next day. Because right. 6 p.m. starts a new day. So no man knows the day of the hour. Hint, hint, hint. And, and, uh, and that's clearly uh, fulfilled by the rapture, by the, the rapture. resurrection. I believe that's prophetic that of comes the from rapture. The saints. And uh, the first part of Christ's second the coming is him sound. coming secretly to take us off the earth, meets us in the clouds. The Bible says that uh, when he comes, every eye shall see him. Obviously, that's the second coming. That's the second phase, which is 10 days later, they celebrate the Feast of Day of Atonement. The Jews call it Yom Kippur. Right. That's, I believe, Christ coming back, Revelation 19, 11, on the white horse to end the Battle of Armageddon. It takes that long. <laughs> he ends the Battle of Armageddon, goes to the Mountain of Olives. It splits in half. 
He rides down the Kidron Valley just like he did 2,000 years ago on that donkey. And you're referencing uh, Zeke. Uh, Zechariah, I believe. Zechariah, fourteen as well. and thirteen and twelve. Yep. Those chapters yep. there at the end. And uh, he he rides in through the eastern gate, and he's going to set up the kingdom. He's going to be crowned and anointed as just like Daniel chapter nine and says. And usher in a millennial reign. Uh, he shall be anointed as the most holy, and and he shall set up the the thousand year millennial reign. It's all in the in the PowerPoint presentation. I actually got a picture of uh, yeah. of a man, uh, of him on the white horse. It's got his face kind of whited out with glory and I like that I don't like that pictures of him but uh -huh. uh, and all the saints are behind him and here we come and that's uh, all it's in the PowerPoint there and then tabernacles that seventh feast is rest it's fellowship it's it's dwelling with God and that's what that's all about so those three feasts will all be fulfilled in the end time the rapture uh, and then the setting up of the right. kingdom seven years later and uh, with the day of atonement and Christ coming on the white horse and then the thousand year kingdom age. So the seven feasts, all prophetic, three left to be fulfilled. Right. I believe like you do. I think it's going to happen on the, the day. The, the problem is we don't know which month is going to be feast. We of trumpets. don't. The Lord knows. Yep. We don't know what year, what month, uh, but we know we're in the season. We know we're very close. Well, let's uh, let's go on forward quickly uh, to talk about the three harvests. And the law of the harvest, uh, that's another topic you bring up. Right, and I, have a, uh, I do a whole section in there on the harvest. See, we miss so much of the Bible because we don't understand farming. Yeah. And those of us that do farm, I've got relatives that farm, they don't farm like they did in the Bible. Uh -huh. <laughs> they take a big John Deere tractor and they wipe the whole thing off at one swath and yeah. take it to the barn <laughs> and, or, or sell it or whatever. In Bible days, the harvest was threefold. First of all, there were three harvests. They right. had the barley in the in Passover time, first fruit. That was the barley harvest season. You go to Pentecost, 49 days later, that's that's wheat harvest. Indeed. By the way, the barley represents Israel. The wheat represents the church. Yeah. Did you know that on Pentecost, the Jews will bake a loaf of barley and a loaf of wheat bread with leaven in them? Not knowing why. Not even realizing that, that that's talking about the Jew and the Gentile. In the church age, Ephesians, there's no difference Ephesians in the Jew and the Gentile. Ephesians chapter 2. Yeah. So yes. And uh, so here we are. But one of these days, the wheat's going to be taken out. Amen. The church is going to go. The fish yeah. is going to be gone. And God's once again going to deal with the barley, the nation of Israel. So there's three harvests. And the third harvest is the fruit harvest in the fall, which is the rapture and the second coming. All, that's all the fruit harvest season. Um, but let's go a little further. Not only is there three harvest in Israel, there's three stages to the harvest. In Bible days, you had what we call the first fruits. And we understand that at Passover time on the Feast of First Fruits, they, they offered the first fruits of the barley and gave that to the Lord. That went to the temple. That's the first fruits of the, that's the first part of your crop out of your garden. I'm not saying you took all the barley and gave it. I'm saying the first of the crop was given to God. And then the main harvest was where you actually went out there and you harvested it. But you were required by the law of Moses, you were required to leave some behind. And then you go to the book of Ruth and you really understand that the gleaners would come. You were required to not cut it all down. Uh -huh. Now, today you get your big John Deere tractor. You wipe the whole field off. There's no gleaners. I'm not sure you could get anybody today to glean. The government just gives it all away. Right. God had a better system. than He that. told the poor to go gather it. God said, uh, uh, don't, don't you know, don't take everything out of your garden, leave some for the poor. But you didn't bag it up and deliver it to the house like we do today. Right. They had to come and work for it. If a man don't work, neither should he eat. Second Thessalonians. I think that's a pretty good system. That is good. I think that's it gives God's a man plan. some pride about his life. Well, work, and, uh, work is a calling. God gave, gave us uh, an assignment to work. Did you know that Ruth? came back with Naomi and because we understand the three harvests barley wheat we know when they came back because when she went to, to uh -huh. glean and in, in, in Boaz's field she was gleaning barley yeah in fact she gleaned all the way into the wheat harvest so she was there for several weeks maybe even six or eight weeks gleaning barley and then going right into the the wheat harvest and gleaning the wheat now important here remember the three phases of a harvest the the first fruits give that goes to God then you get your main harvest, but you leave some behind. The third phase is the gleaning. And I believe there's a gleaning prophetically. I believe prophetically Christ is the first fruits. Precisely. He's the first to bodily rise from the grave. See, the rapture is a, a bodily harvest. And yep. the, this, the, the resurrection is a bodily thing. When you die, we're present with the Lord. To be absent from the body, present with the Lord. The body don't go yet because it hasn't been redeemed yet. It'll be redeemed at the rapture. Christ is the first fruits. 
the rapture is the main harvest but there's another kind of a rapture it's called the gleanings we see that in matthew 24 so misunderstood by the post-trib crowd uh -huh. they mistake the gleanings the, at the end of the tribulation and they automatically say well there's the rapture right there it's a rapture it's not the rapture yeah it's the final right final so that's gathering. The gleaning. see when you understand farming boy it opens up the bible surely surely yeah all right well good that is good and and so uh let's bring up the barley harvest what does that have to do generally with prophecy and that's an open-ended question yeah. to a hungry tiger and i'll tell you <laughs> when i wrote the jubilee book i didn't even fully understand the barley so yeah. i wrote the barley harvest book your folks can get that right here um, but there's also a session in this in here where i do a powerpoint about the barley the barley is that missing piece of the puzzle i missed i think most people missed <laughs> the barley harvest is the reset See, the, se the, the Jewish calendar, the seven feasts, yes. they take place in a seven-month period from the month Nisan or Abib all the way to the month Tishri. Uh -huh. Seven feasts, seven months, 7,000 years of history, God's right, number. Right. The thing is, there's only 354 days on the Jewish calendar. So every year they're missing, mm -hmm. they're missing uh, 11 days. About every three years, they're a whole month off. How do they how did they keep their calendar right? How did they synchronize it to where Passover is at the right time? What they did is the barley. That's why it's called a bib. If you look up a bib in Webster's 1828 dictionary, you'll find that it's talking about the, the ripeness of the barley, the ripeness of the harvest. God said, I brought you out of Egypt. Now we know that's Passover. That was the first Passover. Right. He brought them out of Egypt in the month of bib. What does that mean? It defines itself. I brought you out of Egypt during the barley harvest. And they had that barley because on the Feast of First Fruits during during a bib, they had to they had to have their first fruits of the barley. So there has to be barley. So the barley is the reset. Every year the high priest on the last day of the month of Dar, he would go out to the field and he would look at the barley on the 29th of the month of Dar, right before Passover month, he'd look at the field if the barley was a bib. He would declare uh, it's a bib and then you would plan Passover two weeks down the road. If it wasn't ready, he knew that it's not ripe yet. The calendar's off. They would add an, another another eight hour month. And we call it eight R two. They had eight R one and eight R two. And they so they basically would have 13 months. But every three years, they're going to they're going to adjust this thing. Right. That's how that's how come Passover every year is during barley harvest. Now, today, they don't do it that way. And you can't pay any attention to what they do today. Today, they do it mathematically. They don't look at the barley. They don't look at the harvest. And uh, the, you, know, you can go on your computer. You could find Passover right. 100 years in the future. That's not biblical. God looks at the barley. Uh, the, uh, the, the Jews would look at the barley to determine a bib. And that determines Passover. Resets the whole seven-month calendar. And if they get the barley harvest right, guess what? First fruits will be right. Uh, Pentecost will be on the right day during the wheat harvest. And the Feast of uh, Trumpets will be on the right time in the fall. But if you get Passover wrong, the rest of the feast are all wrong. I want to bring up a point here that you have uh, brought out. I've heard you talk about the feeding of the 5,000 and that that was a barley loaf. They, they, they brought, the boy had five loaves of barley and two fishes. And this is in John chapter 6. Right. And, uh, and it says after they'd all eaten, the, the, the 5,000 men plus women and children had all eaten. And then another time of the assembling of the men again, now, those men weren't there because they didn't have a job. They were there for the unleavened bread time. They, they were required to be in Jerusalem. So he feeds them all, and, they, and then if they, out of those five loaves of bread, they fill up 12 baskets. I mean, if you can imagine, that's a miracle. They fill up the 12 baskets, of, and the Bible specifies with the fragments of the barley. And I, the question I asked was, where's the fish? I believe the fish represents the church. And I believe when the 12 tribes of Israel represented by the 12 baskets, when the 12 tribes are ready in Israel, uh -huh. God will take the fish out and deal with the barley, which is Israel. Now, this is the uh, the sign of the fish, which was uh, very popular in the early centuries for Christians to, right. to give as a code to each other that they were and, believers. And you see it now on bumper stickers. Sure. Car. You sure. see the fish, the sign of Christianity. Peter, you know, I'll make you fishers of men. And I think that maybe that's where that came from. So but, you're drawing the point that Jesus came as the savior of the world. Right. Uh, to be the bread of life, not just for the Jew, but the Gentile. Right. And, and, but the point is with the feeding the 5,000, when he fills the baskets, there's no fish in them. Uh -huh. How many tribes of Israel? There were 12 apostles, 12 baskets. 
but there's also 12 tribes of Israel and those 12 tribes are going to be represented during the tribulation because at the yeah. middle they're going to be assembled and they're going to be the first fruits under God. Oh, they're even named in Revelation. Yeah, the 7. 12 tribes. Yeah. yeah. So what my point that up the prophetic lesson I got when I read that passage was the fact that the fish was gone. And the fragments of the barley filled the 12 baskets. And when God sees the 12 tribes are ready or a bib. Yeah. God takes us out, the church out, and he deals with Israel. And that's what's getting ready to happen. Amen. That's really exciting. Well, just to kind of crack the code open, I'm going to go on into the final jubilee. And uh, brother, we just have uh, really about a minute or two to talk about that. But we can resume that in the following program. But let's go ahead and start down that road what about the final the final jubilee i call it the final jubilee because if you go back to 1500 bc when moses was giving given the the, the jubilee god said the, uh on the 49th year you would announce blow the trumpet for the jubilee and the entire 50th year is the jubilee and uh that was 1500 bc you add the 2000 year church age of jubilees that's 3500 years divided by 50 not 49, but 50, because the entire 50th year has got to be counted. So it's count included. 50s. A lot of people are confused about this. So divide 50 into 3,500, it's 70. Now, we don't know when the Jubilee is. They haven't kept record of it. They haven't kept a Jubilee in thousands of years. I'm not sure there's any record of them ever doing it. God but seems to like the number 70. Yeah, too. so the point is, the next Jubilee, whenever it is, it's number 70. Yeah. I think it's the final Jubilee, brother. Well, on that note, we are going to pause and keep the suspense. We're going to be doing okay. another program with Dan Goodwin, who's been our guest. He is, again, an evangelist, an author, a prophecy teacher, and brings some fascinating insights that we'll be following up on God's final jubilee and what time it really is right now. You'll want to join us for that next program. In the meantime, as you've heard us talk about the feast, everything points to Christ. The heart of the Bible, the heart of God, the heart of our existence is Jesus Christ the God man you heard as we spoke about Passover and the day that Jesus himself was crucified in the darkness that descended on the cross in the darkness my sin and your sin was put on the Holy Son of God and he put it away by his sacrifice and then he was buried and rose and our sin was forever put away when he arose he rose with the promise of new life but it's not automatic that that goes to every person. We must receive Christ. We have to respond to that by repenting of our sin and putting our faith and trust in him. And if you don't do that, when he comes back, you'll meet him as your judge, not your savior. Mm. Call on him today and be saved. And we're going to keep looking up.